The Holy Eucharist Of all the sacraments instituted by our Lord, the Blessed Sacrament is surely the greatest and the most holy. For not only does it give grace to those who receive it worthily, but at the same time it contains the author and the source of all grace, Jesus Christ himself. The other sacraments exist only while they are being administered. But the Blessed Sacrament is something lasting and substantial, and it continues to exist as long as the species, the sacramental species, remain essentially unchanged. More than that, the Blessed Sacrament is not merely a sacrament, but it has a twofold quality. It is at once a sacrament and a sacrifice. It's a sacrament when we receive it in the Holy Communion and when it's reserved and exposed for our adoration. And it's a sacrifice when it's offered to God by the priest during the Holy Mass. The great object of this sacrament is to feed and to nourish our souls so that the supernatural life of grace received in baptism strengthened in confirmation, be perfected and preserved by it. As our Lord says in, a, in, the, the, in the discourse at the Last Supper, if any man eat this bread, he shall live forever, and the bread which I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. The various functions of this host sacrament are demonstrated by the different names which we apply to it. The first Christians spoke of it as the breaking of bread. We frequently call it the Holy Eucharist, which means the Holy Thanksgiving, because at its institution our Lord gave thanks to his eternal Father, and because by it we are enabled to render such thanks to God as are worthy of his acceptance and a homage of infinite value for all the benefits which we have received from him. We also call it Holy Communion because in an especial manner it unites us, the faithful, to Jesus Christ and also to one another as members of the mystical body of which Christ is the head. So the Holy Communion is not merely a, 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 the union of us with Christ, it is the supernatural union of us with each other which constitutes the Church, the mystical body of Christ. We are, in fact, really one mystical body made like one bread, that is to say, compounded by many grains of corn. We are the grains of corn in that mystical bread, closely united together. For we, being many, are one bread, one body, all we who partake of one bread, as St Paul says in the first epistle to the Corinthians. We also speak of it as being the Holy Viaticum, which means the provision for the journey. Which journey? The journey of our pilgrimage through life, and it prepares us for our passage to eternity. We also call it, likewise, the most holy sacrament of the altar, because the mystery of the Blessed Eucharist, which is at once a sacrament and a sacrifice, is effected on our altars. There's an endless number of things that one could say in regard to the Blessed Sacrament. We can discuss the theology of the Holy Eucharist, we can discuss its moral effect on our souls, the fact that it is the ultimate sacrifice of Christ's love whereby he gives himself to us, gives us not merely his gifts but his own self. Here is a very beautiful passage from, a, uh, from 100 Meditations on the Love of God by the English a, uh, Reformation martyr, St. Robert Southall. And I think that these words really express exquisitely, beautifully, the manner and the, uh, and, uh, and, the, and the excellence of God's 
love for us, of Christ's love for us in this holy sacrament. Here's what he says. At the Last Supper, when thou wert to depart, O Lord, from thy dear and well-beloved disciples, thy heart, through the infinite love that thou bearest us, was sore beaten and tossed with two contrary things. For on the one side love said unto thee that thou must depart from us, and on the other side it willed thee to tarry still with us. Love wished thee to depart, in that thy departure, by death and passion, was our redemption and life. And therefore it was expedient that thou shouldst depart, that by this means thou mightest open us the gates of heaven, and prepare us seats in thy glory. All our whole happiness depended upon thy departure, for that going unto the Father by thy cross. By this manner thou restorest us from banishment, and washed our souls with thy blood. This is that which thou sayest to thy apostles at the Last Supper, it is expedient for you that I go. If thou hast not first ascended into heaven, we had never been able to have entered into it, and therefore thy departure imported us no less than our lives, for that the divine ordinance presupposed that without thy death and departure we could never have been saved. And yet, on the other side, that same love which thou bearest to us will thee to remain with us, to, start, to tarry still with us. For he that loves is loath to depart from his beloved, with whom he would always be present. And he feels the grief of his departure according to the greatness of the love which he bears. But thou, O Lord, through thy most high and infinite wisdom, dost accomplish both of these contrary loves, and thou hast performed them both the one and the other. For thou hast departed, and thou hast remained. Thou wentest to thy Father by thy cross and passion, and thou ascendest into heaven. And thou remainest here at the same time on earth with thy militant church really and truly in this most holy sacrament. And this is that which thou sayest to thy disciples at thy departure, I am with you until the end of the world. O infinite wisdom of my God, who could ever have devised such an invention? He departed and he tarried still. He stayed still and he departed. He went unto the Father, and he remains here in the sacrament, and remaining here really and truly under the form of bread and wine. He went to prepare us a place in heaven. I go to the Father, saith he, to prepare you a place. Thou wouldst not, most merciful Lord, leave the church, thy beloved spouse, comfortless, depriving her of thy real presence. When the husband is to make any long absence, he must needs depart from his wife. If she love him truly, she will be heavy and sad for the departure of her husband. And neither will the jewels which she has received at his hands be able to make her merry nor content her, because she esteems more the presence of her husband than his gifts. So, O Lord, after thou hast redeemed and endowed thy spouse, the church, which was before in thraldom of sin, thou gavest her many jewels of grace and sacraments, which thou didst adorn and enrich her with. Yet, albeit, thou hast left her the rich gifts of baptism, confirmation, order, and all the other sacraments, she would always have been sad at having not thy presence, and would have become like a widow. But thou, remaining with her for ever in this wonderful sacrament, in body and in soul, God and perfect man, so great and omnipotent as when thou walkest upon the earth, and as thou art now in heaven, has accomplished her desires, and has showed the immeasurable love with which thou lovest her. For this sovereign love, 
could not suffer that thou shouldst be one hour absent from thy most loving spouse. And therefore it has pleased thee to remain with us after an unspeakable manner in this most holy sacrament, making it a summary of all thy great and ancient wonders. I marvel not that thou couldst do it, but that thou wouldst do it. I know thy omnipotence, and therefore I am not afraid, considering what thou canst do, that being, as thou art God of so great majesty, thou couldst enclose thyself under so base accidents. But I marvel much that thou wouldst do it. O incomparable love and infinite charity of my God, that thou hast vouchsafed to visit man a sinner and to come unto him with thy whole court of angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, and to impart unto our souls the riches of thy grace and glory by such an exquisite and wonderful means as by coming thyself, the King of glory, disguised in a consecrated host. Who were able to approach nigh unto thee if thou camest open and plainly and discovered in the same glory and majesty that thou hast in heaven? How should our eyes be able to abide such an immeasurable clearness and brightness? The children of Israel were not able to endure the brightness of the face of Moses, having but talked with thee upon the mountain, and therefore he was fain to put a veil before his face. Queen Esther fell in a swoon, beholding the majesty of King Asuerus, and when there appeared an angel to the prophet Daniel, he was stricken for dead. How then should we be able to abide so great a glory? or to approach nigh unto thine infinite majesty, if thou, Lord, of great mercy, didst not humble thyself and come veiled and covered under so base elements. Thou showest the infinite love that thou bearest us in dying for us, and to the end that not only the wise, but the ignorant also, might understand the love wherewith thou lovest us. Thou wouldst leave us this sacrament, in memory of the inestimable gift of thy most holy passion. As princes will have their valiant acts not only written of by chroniclers, but also their images set up, embossed in brass, to show to all posterity their worthy deeds, and that the people who cannot read may understand them likewise, so thou, O Lord, our God, not thinking it enough, to have the great work of thy passion and redemption written by the prophets and the evangelists, has placed in this sacrament, as it were, an image and a picture of the memory of that famous victory which thou obtainest on the cross over death and the devil. This sacrament is a lively image and a perpetual memorial of thy sacred passion, as the church singeth, saying, O God, who in this wonderful sacrament has left us the memory of thy passion. Here is represented unto us in the consecrated host thy most holy passion. Thou wilt be known of all and impart thyself unto all, and therefore under these visible kinds of bre bread and wine thou givest thyself unto the faithful as well as to the simple, as to those that are learned. Hereupon thou sayest in the canticle of canticles, I am the flower of the field. Of the flowers of enclosed orchards and gardens, none but particular men have the use and pleasure, and those that are the owners of such gardens. But of the flowers of the field, every man taketh his pleasure, and they be so common to all, as well little as to great. Thou sayest very well, my God, that thou art a flower of the field, seeing that thou communicatest with all, and givest thyself unto any, giving thyself in this sacrament 
as well to the poor and little ones as to the rich and the mighty. Thy charity is not abridged, but very largely extended, which embraces and overshadows all men. Deo gratias.